afternoon, everyone. It's a few minutes past twelve. Um, welcome. I, my first task is of is to welcome everyone who's here, but by but I will spend the time doing a slightly longer introduction of our speaker. But before I do that, let me just say that this le this lecture fits into our a series that the Institute is engaged in now, the Making of Caribbean Feminisms Conversation. We have a project that is called Making of Caribbean Feminisms that's been, that's been rolled out for several years now, and this component is, um, is geared specifically to inviting people who have been part of or have contributions to me that we, we also videotape and post on the internet and on, on YouTube, so it's available as well after. I want um, to welcome Professor Samru, Princess Samru, who's well known to some of us, um, and to thank him in advance for giving up his time to be here with us today. He, for those of you who are not aware of Professor Samru's long and illustrious history, in both the university and outside, let me just remind you that he has been and is one of our icon, iconic historians in the um, in Trinidad and Tobago and in the Caribbean for that matter. He obtained his Bachelor of Arts and his MA in History from Delhi University. Um, and I know he's fluent in Hindi. And, um, and his PhD from the University of London. He's published extensively on the history of Trinidad and Tobago with specialty in working class movements, Indo-Caribbean history and political and institutional development. He has over 40 published papers and several key and seminal edited books as well as um, which have also contributed to this, as well as recently, the recent publication is um, which you will flag, um, The Price of Conscience, which is on Howard Noel Nankerville, who is the husband of the Florence that you'll be speaking about today. But this is hot off the press and very delightful reading. Um, but apart from his work within the university, Professor Samru has served as a, between 1987 and 1991, he was a minister of government. Um, so he's had a, a history outside of the university as well, engaging in the seat of power. Um, he, but at the university itself, he's been the head of the history department at UWI and has, of course, as all of us, worked with in numerous committees. He has also served as a senior research fellow at the Academy of the University of Trinidad and Tobago for Arts and Letters. And at present, one of the most exciting things I know he's involved in now is the Chair of the State Appointed Committee on Development of a Sugar Museum and Sugar Heritage Village in Central Trinidad. And for those of you who don't know that project, it is really worthwhile looking at it and investigating it. And I have had the pleasure of attending um, events that he's organized. Today he will speak on Florence Nankeville. I, I know he will introduce it, so I won't... Um, I won't say anything more other than to say that we as an Institute for Gender and Development Studies, we look forward to broadening the scope of what we know of and constitute as the contribution to feminism, which is what this project is about. And the last thing I would say is that um, I have always been, um, Professor Samru is always a delightful speaker. He's always engaging, he, he has the, the knack of making history and history into the storytelling that we need that that we um, benefit most from it. So Professor Samu, thank you again and the floor is yours. All right, thank you very much, Pat. And um, <clears throat> let me just let me just say I had a great difficulty in choosing which uh, person I would I would speak about today. I, I had a real difficulty because there's a woman um, you know, whom, whom I know very, very well, Indian woman, who, who, who is a, an absolutely <coughs> remarkable person. Her name is Bhikni, Bhikni, and Bhikni came to Trinidad uh, as a little <coughs> child and infant, and she is a truly remarkable woman. And um, 
So I do hope sometime again you'd invite me to talk about Hickney um, and, and Pat went to the estate that she created. And she got an estate of five, five acres and when she died in 1937, she left 520 acres, which is still there. And, and Pat and others went and we did a tour there. So that's a, a good tour that I, I would uh, recommend to you and I could arrange the tour and talk to you in situ. That is in a place that, that she developed, a truly remarkable woman. Um, so possibly we'd leave that for some other time. But so, so the, the other choice was to talk about Florence Nan Kivel. And I had done a little, a little write-up which, which I thought would have been distributed. But more important than that, and I think each one of you should make sure you get a copy here. Uh, because it, it, I, I gave it about two weeks ago, a memorandum for the Royal West Indian Commission given by Mrs. Nankivel. I would like each one of you to get a copy and, 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 and I would say that if there is anybody who is interested in doing some further work on Mrs. Nankivel, she gave me, she gave me a lot of her letters and personal papers and personal documents. Which, which I have. She died in 1993, but I became very close to her during my, my years in London. And, and it is out of, out of that closeness that this book has now come out, The Price of Conscience. <coughs> it's called The Price of Conscience, Howard Noel Nankivel and Labor Unrest in the British Caribbean in 1937 and 1938. That is the the name of the text, and I think she, she inspired me very much to write this, and that's why the book is dedicated to Florence Nankivel and to her son Edmund and Gillian Nankivel, who really gave, opened up all the Nankivel papers to me and, and, and enabled me to write this. But I just want to say, in case anybody's interested, that I have a lot of her other documents, and, and, and I hope we can have a, a good discussion on Florence Nankivel. Today. So let me just let me just read the, the, the one or two paragraphs that I have written, which I thought you would have had, because my intention was to speak outside of this little text I've done and say additional things about Florence Nankivel. So possibly we could still do that. So let me just read what, what I have written. Um, in January 1929, Howard Nankivel was transferred on promotion from first class. Clark in Jamaica to acting colonial secretary in Trinbago. In mid-1938, he was transferred on demotion as colonial treasurer in Cyprus, which was at that time far less important than oil and sugar-rich Trinbago. In a male-dominated colonial environment, the wives of the ruling elite were aptly described by colonial society as birds of passage. They were active members of the cocktail circuit, often called upon to open a creche or a bazaar, or to accompany their husbands on formal occasions. And I just want to read one, one uh, reminiscence of Lady Young. Lady Young was the wife of the governor who came here. He came here in 1930 eight to replace Murchison Fletcher, about whom we shall speak. And I just wanted to read a paragraph from Lady Young's letter to the Secretary of State, Ma Malcolm MacDonald. Local white Creoles have no conception of manners, loyalty, or any other civilized virtue. They simply do not live in the same box as ordinary human beings. One cannot calculate what any of their reactions are. They are as strange and remote morally as the Africans and lower caste Indians who have, as everything else tends to sink, much influenced the whole trend of life in these islands. So, so that's the kind of information that these uh, official wives sent back to London. Florence Musken Nankivel. Uh, she was born in 1901 and died in 1993. Wife of Howard Nankivel was an exception to this rule. 
Born in Holland, she obtained a secondary school education in England at a Quaker school. In 1903, she came to Trinbago, not 1903, 1930. She came to Trinbago on a holiday where she met Howard Nankivell. On the 19th of May, 1932, the couple were married at the Grey Friars Presbyterian Church in Port of Spain. And in the book, I have quite a, what I think is a humorous description of, of, of that wedding and how she is described. And from that time until her forced departure in 1938, she immersed herself in social work among women and children in this colony. One of her principal allies was Audrey Jeffers, who had spent some years in London during the First World War uh, when Audrey was a student there. Florence Dankivell became an activist in the coterie of social workers founded by Jeffers in 1921. She was an accomplished uh, soloist and pianist, giving performance after performance. I am amazed at the number of performances she gave um, in order to raise funds. She never took a cent of it herself, but she was always fundraising for, every, for a variety of social service volunteer organizations. These included the Sanatorium Fund, which assisted people with tuberculosis, the Nazareth Home for Disabled Children, and the Child Welfare League. She befriended women trade unionists and traveled to central Trinidad to look at the disease-ridden lives of the sugar workers. This unwilling imperialist had a keen interest in Caribbean history and sociology. She sought and read the then available books on the region in order to understand the society to explain it to her contemporaries who resided here and to British audiences after her return to England in 1938. Among her personal papers, there are lectures on things like Mother's Day, Women and Social Work, delivered in Trinbago, and others like Jewels of the Caribbean Sea, and What About the West Indies, delivered um, in, in, in the United Kingdom when she went back. She held strong views on slavery, indentiship, Europeans in the West Indies, and the historical roots of black disenfranchisement. Her major piece of writing was a lengthy memorandum to the Moyne Commission, which was sent to the Caribbean in 1938 in the wake of serious disturbances in 37 and 38. This memorandum was a scathing indictment of colonial rule, particularly as this applied to women and children. It gives a detailed description of the exploitation of women, health conditions, and poor labor representation. The memorandum also gives a clear indication of what remedial measures uh, which were urgently needed. The Moyne Commission did, in fact, receive the memorandum. When I look at the documents received by the memorandum, Mrs. Nankivell's paper was certainly there. But the Moyne Commission refused her request. She made a request that, that she wanted to appear before the Moyne Commission to elaborate on, on what she had said in this major document. But um, they never responded to her. And one of the things she told me is how disappointed she was because she said, look, and she gave me a whole bunch of papers, how much more I have, how much more I could have given to these fellows, but, but they are. The Moyne Commission completely refused to see her. She was in England when the Commission returned and, and she lived in London where the Commission was hearing evidence from home-based West Indian interests. Never, nevertheless, there were two progressive British women on the commission who ensured that most of the Nankivell recommendations were included in the final Moyne Commission report. British effort to implement these recommendations formed a major aspect of the post-Moyne um, period, what, what happened after 1945, where they, they had a whole set of changes and so on which we could talk about. In May of 1936, two of the colony's major Calypsonians, Gorilla and Attila, praised the work of Florence Nankivell 
in public performances and the coterie presented her with a, a very beautifully prepared script handwritten on the, on the eve of her departure. Long after her departure from Trinbago, Florence Nankivel maintained contact with her Caribbean friends. For example, she was asking me all the time about Ho Choi, Solomon Ho Choi, who started his career when the Nankivels were here. During the 1960s and 70s, she visited Jamaica twice, and in February 1966, she spent two weeks in Trinidad, mainly in the company of Audrey Jeffers. She visited Mayaro, where she had bathed, and I quote her, a long, long time ago. And she enjoyed an invitation to the Governor General's reception for the visiting Queen Elizabeth. This presentation will focus on the life and activities of a truly remarkable woman who sadly has hitherto been hidden from Trinbago's history. At the very least, I am suggesting that her memo to the Moyne Commission, the trigger for later reform, should be considered as a major document in West Indian history. And one of the things I do in the book is, is, is look at <coughs> her recommendations in this document and then juxtapose that uh, beside the recommendations of the Moyne Commission. And, 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 and if, you, if you read it in some detail, you'd see how, how remarkably close uh, Florence Nankivel's recommendations were to what the Moyne Commission recommended for the whole of the Caribbean and which became a, a major plank of British colonial policy in the post moyne um, in the post moyne era, in the post-1945 era. So this, this document um, is, is dated September 1938, and here she, she uses her knowledge of Caribbean history, and I was, I was rather surprised that, that all the texts that I could have mentioned to her, she said, you know, I, I've, re I've read all of those. And I thought that that, that, was, that was remarkable. I'm talking about the old texts, those that were written um, up to 1938. So she made sure she understood, she, she looked, she read West Indian history. And then because of, of her love for, the, for this place, she, she tried her best to integrate herself into the society and, and, and was all over the place talking to trade unionists, particularly women, looking at, at social problems. And, 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 and she talks about all of these things. She gives a kind of class analysis of, of the, the, the Caribbean. Roughly speaking, the population can be divided as follows. A, category A, she put A, Negroes and East Indians. B, Chinese, Portuguese, Venezuelan. C, local French descendants, local English descendants, imported English. So she, she, she talks about, she, she categorizes all of these groups who have come to the Caribbean and, in, in her view, form the whole class system and talks about and talks about all of them. The East Indians, after their release from indentured labor, have remained more or less connected with the land. They are a thrifty people and prefer to save money or invest it in silver bracelets than spend it on nutritious food. Whilst there is no caste division, they have, they, they, they have maintained tra traditional habits, um, tradition, tradition in their habits and their food. And then she talks about the, how they live on their estate. As far as, uh, they, as, as, far as I, I saw, they are still housed in barracks on their estates. And the question of proper housing for them is a very urgent one, combined with an education towards the consumption of a balanced diet. A Dutch doctor, Dr. Van Schlieven, who made some studies among these people several years ago, was dismayed at their deficiency symptoms, where a man is often finished for heavy work at 45. Needless to say, this reflects on the women and children too. So she talks about all of these, all of these uh, various categories. The Negro's character is difficult to understand for a Western mind. There is, for example, their great an often well-founded distrust of each other. They do each other in as much as and as often as they can. They will steal the possessions of blind people. They play dirty tricks on each other. 
when they get a position of authority, for instance, uh, they, they, for instance, the nurses towards their patients or doctors towards their nurses, they often really mean to each other. This can be viewed as a stage in their moral growth. A most important necessity is education and character building to be tackled from all um, on various sides, in schools, talks, lectures for the young and adult. Book learning as given today is not their primary need. It is an education put upon them and not built out of them. Their needs, their character or their mode of living are not taken into consideration. A review of the education is one of the main problems to be tackled. So these are the, these are some of the, the views that as she has, I found the position of women in the laboring classes a very hard one. The labor market begins to fill up with untrained women. There is nowhere for them to train. In the old-fashioned households, the servants come very young and were trained by the mistress. Mistresses have often changed and nowadays demands, uh, they demand already trained domestic workers. When I left Trinidad, the shop wage committee was still sitting but wages of these girls in the shops are very low in the Syrian shops, often with, and she quotes, with necessities attached to them. No wonder these girls have to find an additional way of earning money. True, they are often slow and not efficient, but Trinidad especially suffers from the lack of any standard of efficiency. Everything is good enough, but on the other hand, any development is hampered by a feeling of great self-satisfaction beyond all comparison. Through lack of contact, they do not realize how low in many ways the standard really is, especially when they really want to compare. So that um, this, 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 these are the, the comments that, that she made. Um, a lot of them are reflective of the prejudices of the time. Nevertheless, I think the document is an important document. And, and, you know, I would like to see it, you know, and, and the other things about Florence Nankivell, in addition to, as I said, lengthy correspondence and diaries and letters and so on, which she, which, which she left with me, but which I, I could not include in the book. But I do hope that, that somebody here would find some time to, to really explore this absolutely remarkable woman. So I just end there, but I hope we could have some more discussion on this.